floor had a different set of, of topics that we'd talk about. And the idea was that all of this was integrated together and that he would, he would affect his, his audience uh, using this uh, museum. So what I'd like to do is have my own sort of mini outlook tower and start at the top and, and work downward. And I'm going to start at the camera obscura. So the camera obscura is, is this rather interesting uh, device. Uh, it's very, very ancient. I think the first writing was actually uh, from uh, China about it. It's a, it's a box with a tiny hole and light comes through it. And you can actually see the picture on the other side inside the box. It's how cameras work today. Uh, it's flipped upside down, so maybe some lenses make it a little bit easier. But it turns out Getty's camera obscura could hold 30 people inside, and it had multiple lenses, and it was actually at the top of the mile, so it could actually look over the entire city. This is actually a picture from the uh, Outlook Tower. This is, uh, this is a picture of Edinburgh. This is exactly what it looks like when you're inside the building. So think of this, 1890s, 1892, people are looking at what amounts to a hidden camera, home movies, of their friends in the city. This was amazing to people. And it helped to change their perspective about what they could see over the city and their place in the city. And this was really important to, to get us, to give this idea of giving people a chance to suddenly realize they could see things they hadn't seen before, that they could focus on things, that they could learn what their relationship was like. Geddes was a very interesting man. He, he had these things that he called thinking machines. He drew out these squares, and he set up relationships between things, and it helped him think about ideas. We would call these mind maps today. He was doing this at the turn of the century. So it's very, very interesting. He also turned out he was actually a very mercurial man. Apparently, he was very hard to work with. He started lots of projects he never finished because he would go off into the woods and enjoy the woods. But Geddes was this incredible man who was focused on this notion of helping us learn to see what we never recognized right below our feet. So let's move to the next room. We're out of the camera obscura now. And I want to talk to you about the, the Mondo Tech. Mondo Tech. The Mondo Tech. So this is a man, Paul Otlet. Paul Otlet was, uh, uh, lived in Belgium. And in 1935, he writes this treatise that describes what he calls the Mondo Tech. It's a workstation in 1935. It has all sorts of material that you could use to inspect and learn and look up information. Here's actually a very carefully constructed version of that workstation. You'll notice there are, there are these charts here at the top that look a lot like Getty's charts, Getty's thinking charts, because the two of them talked together quite a bit. They were actually quite good friends. Lots of rows for, for cards. Uh, Otley was one of the first people to start thinking about using index cards to organize information. Uh, he, he did a lot of work with that. There's microscopes. There's even a radio device. He had this notion that we would hear broadcasts specifically for us, our own personal broadcast of information. This is in 1935. There was even a microfilm reader in this machine. Now, if you saw my talk three years ago, you might think it looks like this, which is Vannevar Bush's Memex an article he wrote in the Atlantic Monthly in 1945, 10 years after Otley had designed his machine, one year after Otley had died in 1944. So Vannevar Bush wrote this article, as we may think, talking about what the future would be. And we think we model our computers quite a bit on this. But it turns out it's very much like this, which is really quite amazing to me. So uh, it turns out all these ideas that Otley had were tied up in the notion of all these cards that he had collected in what he called his uh, Palais Mondial, his World Palace. And this was the World Palace of Information. At, at one point, he had 12 million of these index cards created, indexing all the information from books and papers, newspapers, anything he could get his hands on, documents, letters, everything. And he had a very complex system for category. Categ classifying them. It was called the Universal Decimal Classification, which may sound like the Dewey Decimal System. This is, this is Melville Dewey. And again, Otley had talked with Melville Dewey, and they worked together. He expanded Dewey's system to be a much more rich and much more complex thing. Now, you can't really see it from here, but it turns out that Otley didn't just use numbers. He also used uh, colons and parentheses and all sorts of other characters so that he could indicate relationships between one thing and another, one category and another, and cross-references. So this identifier is actually very rich with all sorts of information. It isn't just one thing, but it says it's related to lots of things. 
In fact, uh, several people who've studied this say that this idea seems to look an awful lot like the RDF triple stories that we have in Semantic Web today. But this was designed in the 20s. So Otley was this incredible man. He had this device all set up. There was all sorts of things that he was hoping that we could do with it. Now there's another person who was doing a lot of things with devices, and this is Alan Kay. Alan Kay was born in 1940. That's um, just four or five years after Otley's death. But um, by the time, or, or before Otley's death, by the time he was three, he could read already. In fact, he has told interviewers that that became a problem for him. By the time he got to the first grade, he'd read 150 books. He said he already knew the teachers were lying to him. Made for a rough school experience, I think. He grew up and uh, uh, went to school in Colorado, got degrees in mathematics and molecular biology and eventually a PhD in engineering. He was a professional musician for a long time until his job got in the way. That job was at a thing called the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, where they were building something called the ARPANET. And he, it got kind of busy, so he stopped his musician's job to focus more on ARPANET. He met uh, Seymour Papier, who uh, had invented a language called Logo for students, and this really affected uh, Alan Kay quite a bit. When he left ARPANET to go work at another place called Xerox Park, he took these ideas with him. He ended up inventing a language called Smalltalk, and the idea of object-oriented programming that we use today it was all something that he had, he had created at that time at, at Xerox Park. So Alan Kay, through all these things, has done some amazing uh, uh, things that affect us, but there's one in particular that I was really impressed by. At a time when computers were as big as a room, in 1968, he said, no, what we need is a computer that every child can use. Every child can use, that makes no sense. Look how big they are. He said, no, it's going to look like this. In 1968. And in 1972, he built a mock-up just to help people understand what the computer could look like in the future. By the way, that's a Microsoft Surface next to it. More than half a century ahead of his time in thinking about what computers would be like. The man was incredible, and he's done these kinds of things several times. He's still very much involved in working in uh, children and computing. He, he now has a, a nonprofit institute that he spends all his time on, Viewpoints Research. He says Viewpoints because he says Viewpoints are worth 80 IQ points. Just changing your viewpoint makes you much, much smarter. It sounds just like Giddy's. And he's still working. He changed his small talk. He created a new language called Squeak for children to use with comp computers. And he's helped design the one laptop per child computer. And he's still very much involved in that project as well. So he's really an incredible man. People have asked him how he's so good at predicting the future. And this is his answer. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. And by the way, he says that's a very dangerous idea. You can invent lots of futures. Okay, let's go to the next room. From individuals to collective intelligence. At the same time at Xerox Park, when Alan Kay is there, there's another man there by the name of Douglas Engelbart. Douglas Engelbart is really a, a very interesting guy. Born in 1925 to a, a, a very small uh, town in Oregon. He has a rather simple life. He kind of breezes through school. He's got no major indications that he's a brainchild of any type. Uh, he's in college, but he gets interrupted. He gets sent off to World War II. He operates a radar station in the Philippines, and he's bored, and he reads an old magazine, the Atlantic Monthly, from 1945. He reads Vannevar Bush's article about the Memex, and he says, wow, that sounds very interesting. Maybe when I get home, I should actually do something. He settles down, he gets home, he gets a little worried, he gets a little concerned. He thinks about Vannevar Bush and this Memex, and he says, you know, I kind of need a goal in life. I, I need to be doing something. So he sets up an idea. When he gets home, he says, I need to think about a goal for my life. So this is his goal. This is what he decides to do. I would focus my career on making the world a better place for humankind. His focus is not a startup, it's not an invention, it's not money, it's not fame, it's humankind. I think that's amazing. 
It's simply amazing. At a time when computers took months or weeks to program like this, and by the way, this is the programmer. This is not a secretary. Women were the most common programmers in the early days of computing. He also, like Kay, thinks, no, no, no. We need something called interactive computing. Interactive computing, what's that? No, you, you talk directly to it, and you interact with it. When There's a screen, there's a television, there's all sorts of pieces to it. It turns out he had a terrible time getting people to understand his ideas. They thought it was stupid. Didn't make any sense at all. He finally hits on a, on, on a notion. Um, what I have to do is I'm going to rent a huge hall, bigger than this. I'm going to rent a huge hall, and I'm going to give a demonstration of my ideas. Engelbart invents the demo in 1968, the same year that the Dynabook is invented by Alan Kay. So he literally does that. He rents this huge hall next to a computer convention. He gets money from Xerox Park to do this. He invents this hall and decides he's going to show people in a 90-minute presentation what he's thinking about, what interactive computing really is. Here's him actually on stage live editing a shopping list, which was actually very impressive in 1968 to be able to do that interactively. He and his team showed off lots of things that he thought computers should be able to do that were totally new, total marvels. Here's some of them. Oh, here's, here's one of them right here. He showed off teleconferencing, video conferencing, picture in the screen while they were editing. And you can't tell it from here, but there are actually more than one cursor. There are multiple people editing this document in 1968. Here's a few things they thought up. Windowing, hypertext, graphics, command inputs, video conferencing. He invented the mouse just for the demo. Uh, world processing, dynamic file linking, revision control. What a crazy idea that is. And real-time collaborative editing where you had multiple cursors that had people's initials on them. 1968. This is what the machine looked like on his end. This, is, this was the screen, the keyboard, the first invention of the mouse, and commands were also done with another hand over here. Originally, he had it as a foot pedal. It didn't work so well. He switched to this. This was really incredible. This all came from some ideas, that whole thing about humankind. He wrote a research paper in 1962 called Augmenting Human Intellect. This was his whole idea. We would create computers that would help us to think better. And then, thinking better, we would create better computers that would help us to think better. This was his plan. He called it bootstrapping. This is how he was going to help humankind. He worked for decades on this. And most of the ideas that you saw were taken at Xerox Park and turned into what we know as the personal computing. He actually didn't want to work on personal computing. He wanted to work on shared collaborative computing. And in fact, many of the things that he wanted to do never came to fruition. Even today, we still don't do the collaborative stuff that he talked about in 1968, that he showed, that he coded in 1968. Uh, Douglas Engelpart died last July, which is a really disappointment for me and for lots of people. I had really hoped that I would get to meet him, but I did not. He spent his last years working on his institute, doing the same kinds of things that Alan Kay is doing today, figuring out ways to help humankind, to help people, to use computers, computers to help people augment their intellect. Okay, next room. 1937, there's a man born in Chicago and then moves quickly to, um, thank you, moves quickly to Greenwich Village. This is Ted Nelson. Ted Nelson, as a kid, moves to Greenwich Village in the 1950s where it's happening, man. This is beatnik town. This is fantastic. And he drinks all this up. He gets all this counterculture activity, and he drives it into all sorts of ideas. Unlike Alan Kay, who was born just a few years after him, he doesn't have a math degree. He's, he's not this brilliant biologist. He goes to Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania and he makes a film, he makes a student film. He's gonna be a film director, but he gets frustrated in the process. He ends up eventually uh, graduating with a sociology degree. Sociology, get us? He graduates in this degree, but along the way, uh, although he picks sociology, this, this idea about this uh, human intelligence uh, isn't even a, a thought of, of an idea yet. This was actually done in 1962. He graduates in 63. He doesn't have anything to do with Xerox Park. 
But what he does do is he writes these movie scores, and he's complaining. He says, this isn't right. This is too hard. This is too hard for me to figure out. A computer should be able to figure this out. He's talking about this computer in the 60s. This is years, five, six years before Engelbart even does his demo, and he already wants an interactive computer to help him solve his problem. So he creates what's called the Xanadu Project in the early 60s. This is going to solve all the problems. He's actually thinking about interactive shared computing with all sorts of links. And a matter of fact, his idea of links and how links should work in information look an awful lot like Otley's idea about how links sh should work in information. Otley's ideas are now 80 years old to him. Along the way, he invents words, he invents hypertext, he invents hypermedia, hyperdata, transclusion, intertwingled, lots of words, because there are no words for the ideas he has about the way things connect together. He puts a lot of this in a book, actually a double book, uh, in typical hippie fashion. It's a book that's handwritten, and it's two books back to back. You read it halfway through, you turn it around, flip it over, and read the other half. The first one is called uh, uh, Computer Lib, the second one is called Machine Dreams. And in it, he talks about how important it is for computers to be for people, not companies, not the military. In fact, one of his famous quotes from there is, "Computers, the purpose of computers are freedom. And he dedicates his life to this idea of computers that actually should be something that people want to use. So nothing about Xerox PARC, nothing about ARPANET, he never sees any of this. But instead, he invents this notion of the way a web of documents will work, where there are always forward and backward links, where you can always see the provenance and who wrote something, where you can always look at every single version of the document all through history of every document in the system. We still can't even do this today in the World Wide Web. And he already thought of it and started building it in the late 60s. So it turns out that Engelbart and Nelson are actually sort of kindred spirits. They both have these fantastic ideas about what a computer could do, and most people ignore them. They had to work very, very hard to get their ideas heard, and even, even today, we don't do a lot of things that, uh, that they had thought about. And you may have noticed that Ted is rather mischievous. Ted has always been a raconteur. Ted always creates a stir. Even, even now behind me, I think he's actually giving me a hard time, right? Has anybody noticed anything about, about Ted? I think Ted winks every now and then. Um, it turns out that uh, Ted gave a very moving eulogy for Douglas Engelbart last year in July. And one of the quotes that, uh, that Ted used, which I thought was really, really good, knowing what we know today, he said, for Doug, that great demo was just a beginning. Doug's 90-minute demo, the demo that we now call the mother of all demos, was really just the start. It was like, people, look, look at these cool things we could do. So people... People worked hard to try to see if they could do just some of those. For, for, for Doug, it was just the start of what was possible. And of course, now he's gone. Ted Nelson is still around. He's still causing trouble. Last year, he said he knew who uh, the inventor of Bitcoin was. He wrote a video about, said a video about it. People are actually still using his Xanadu project. This is actually in a browser window where we can actually see some of it working. I, I got, a, got a version of this uh, firsthand la uh, last April. And who knows, maybe in Ted's lifetime, we will see computer liberation. But it's not so sure yet. OK, next room, the world city. Let's get back to Otley. So Otley was uh, born in 1863, died in 1944. Spent all his life working on these notions of trying to build understanding through the sharing of information, building the first taxonomy systems, the first idea of how we would have a world information. Uh, Boyd Rayward, who's uh, one of his biographers, said that, that it turns out that Otley's invention, this thing called the International uh, uh, Bibliography Society, there's all these things that he created, actually establishes the notion of library science that we have today. This machine really launched lots and lots of things, and like uh, Doug Engelbart, this was really just the start. He also thought about how the network would work. He also thought about how people could contact the central source and get information, how groups of people could watch movies, how individual cards could be selected and broadcast to other people. So even in the 30s, he's thinking about television and movie and video and all these things. He's thinking about a device that has interactive telephone voice, broadcast radio, recordings, films, and even television. 
all in the 30s. All before all these other people, before Bush, before Engelbart, before even Nelson, or even Tim Berners-Lee. By the way, if you want to learn more about Atlay, this is a great book, Cataloging the World by Alex Wright. Alex Wright right now is in Belgium at the old site of Atlay's uh, uh, library, helping rebuild the library, the Mundanium. Uh, if, if I wasn't here, I would actually be in Belgium this week. Uh, both Rayward, I think, and uh, uh, Alex Wright are there. It's an incredible set of stories, and Google is funding most of the activity to restart the Mundanium. So, Atlay was, was really thinking big. He was behind, he was uh, supportive of the League of Nations. He actually talked to Woodrow Wilson directly to try to g encourage him to create the League of Nations. He talked to Andrew Carnegie, who was funding a lot of it, hoping that they would all build the League of Nations in Brussels, in his city, where he wanted to create what he called the World City, or the Universal Center, or the Central City. Here's an, a drawing of what one architect's view of the Central City. You'll notice, these are the, these are the ocean-going steamliners. Those are the statues. Typical 1920s, right? This is Henrik Andersen's design, who did a lot of Beau Arts uh, 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 design. Eventually, uh, Atle had to end his relationship with Henrik Andersen, because Henrik Andersen suddenly thought that Mussolini was a great guy. So that's a kind of a bummer. So he finds somebody else to design a much more reasonable, much uh, more enjoyable place. This is Le Corbusier, the Swiss architect that we know that is uh, uh, actually done all these buildings that we would recognize also all sorts of the world. And it turns out the two of them were very much friends till the very end, and he loved Corbusier's building more than anyone else. Alas, he never got to see his world city, his little sort of Vatican of information, where domain experts would come and work with bibliographic experts to create these taxonomies of information. It just never came to pass. Okay, we have one more room. The intergalactic network room. So there's another man that had big ideas. J.C.R. Licklider. Who's ever heard of J.C.R. Licklider? Almost no one. For good reason. He was, a really, he was a very quiet man, but he was very determined. Born in 1915, son of a Baptist minister in St. Louis, Missouri, he goes on to ha get degrees in mathematics and science and acoustics uh, and uh, um, physics in St. Louis at Washington State University. He then goes on to Harvard where he works and gets a degree in psychoacoustics, the way we hear. Psychoacoustics. As a matter of fact, he moves on to MIT and does a brilliant paper that we don't really need to worry too much about called the duplex theory of pitch perception. But what he does is he models the ear using frequencies and capacitors and resistors. And this is an incredible idea. What he does is he actually leans on the work of Norbert Weiner and Claude Shannon, people who are really at the start of the information age, of the computer age, uh, the modern information age. And it turns out most computers in the early days were actually done by uh, uh, analog, not digital. They actually did mathematics through frequencies, not registers. So Lick is really good at this. They call him Lick, that's his nickname. So he's really good at this and he falls in with this crowd and he's fascinated by computers. Uh, later he goes on, he works at a company called BBN, and he has a little extra money at the end of the year. He buys the first PDP-1 computer, right? This is for experiments on his own. He gets fascinated by what computers could do. And while he's working at this military contractor, BBN, he gets involved in a project called the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or DARPA. They drop the D, they call it ARPA, and they invent a thing called the ARPANET. Licklider, Invent, helped invent the ARPANET and pay for it, right? Al Gore in the US sometimes says he does this. It was actually this guy, J.C.R. Licklider. So the ARPANET becomes the internet that we use today. J.C.R. Licklider figured that out. But what he did that really fascinates me is, is dashing off a memo in 1963 for the members and affiliates of the Intergalactic Computer Network. In this message, he's talking about this memo. He's talking about how we're going to get computers to talk to each other, computers that have never seen each other, computers that are possibly from another world. He calls them uncorrelated sapient beings. He's actually thinking about how we're going to talk to aliens in 1963. Now, that sounds a little weird, but in 1963 in the US, things were kind of weird. Okay, so he was really just trying to think ahead. He was really just trying to consider the idea that someday our computers might talk to their computers, right? This was his idea. 
And it turns out now we actually have a protocol that's called the LTP or Lick Lighter Transmission Protocol. It's actually an RFC 5325. And what does this do? This is a protocol for talking to machines in outer space. Lick is in outer space, just like you'd planned all along. It's really incredible. Now, this work is actually uh, 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 supervised and funded by the CCSDS, which is all of the space agencies on, in, in the world get together and share their information, and the LTP and several other protocols are all part of their purview. So we have the internet in space, partly because of Licklighter. We have the internet here because of Licklighter. He's really quite an incredible guy, a very quiet, unassuming guy that none of us really know about. It turns out he had one other project that he worked on. He funded this place called Xerox Park, where Engelbart does the mouse, where uh, Alan Kay creates small talk and talks about object programming, where all of the stuff that we're playing with today, those paradigms actually grow up because Licklighter funded Xerox Park. Okay. We've gotten to the last room, the in-look room. This was a very unusual room in Getty's uh, library. It was dark like the camera obscura, but there was just one chair in the room. And each visitor was invited to sit in the chair in the dark and think about all the things that they had learned today, all the interrelationships, all the things that have happened in the past, and your role in the future. All of these individuals, if you think about it, have a similar trait. They all worked on projects well beyond the current timeline and, and not for profit, but for the betterment of mankind, for world peace, to free people, to help people grow uh, more intelligent in the future. So I'm asking you now, at the very end of this talk, let's just take a minute. Let's just close our eyes for that 60 seconds and think about what we can do about the future of computing, the role that we can play in the next 50 years to 100 years. Let's just take a minute. Let's just close our eyes for just a second. It's been hard to uh, share information for years. The printing press, of course, was the great step into sharing information, but the printing press didn't essentially handle the problem of distributing it. Sorry about that. It would have been so cool, too. Well, I'm not going to be able to play the last piece. So what I have is a three-minute video of quotes from all of the people that we had met today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post the video, and I'm going to ask you to take a look at it. So Lick Leiter and Engelbart and Tim Berners-Lee, who we didn't get a chance to meet, and Ted Nelson and Alan Kay, all talking about their ideas about the future of computing. So. I thank you for your indulgence. I want to encourage you to think about what we did today, think about what we talked about. There are lots of things that we can learn from our past, and that means that there are lots of things that we can do to do what Alan Kay talked about, which is to invent the future that we're looking for. So I want to just say thank you very much. Yeah, the first demo was four years ago, and we still have still issues with demos. <laughs> so we have time for one question. I will take it. Nobody want to jump. So, Mike, 
what did we invent today? You know? Today? Yeah, yeah. So I often, we had a discussion one time. Yeah. I said I was physicist first, and in physics, we, we didn't invent something since the first 30 years of the 20th century, right? With the quantum physics, everything is from this, and we didn't have any revolution. So for software, what did we invent in the last 20 years? So it's, it's interesting that you would say that. So one of the quotes that Alan Kay talks about in this clip is that as far as he's concerned, we haven't invented anything in 30 years. That all we're doing is actually living off the inventions from that period between uh, the first half of the century. So are we waiting, like in physics, a new golden age of computer, uh, computer science? And ah. ask, are you asking yeah. us to, yeah. to think about it today? Make yes, it? that's exactly what I'm asking people to think about. Have we invented it all? Is it done? Or are there more things? What Lick and several other people did is they thought about computing that we couldn't even imagine at one point. And they made a lot of it come true. And that's what I would like to see more of. I think there, there are probably people in this room who have ideas about what computing could be in 50, 60, 70 years. And it may be impossible to convince any of their friends what that would be. I, I, one, one, of the, one of the things I found is uh, Ted Nelson ended up getting in arguments with people. There's a recording of him on radio arguing with people, trying to explain to them what computing could be like. Because people didn't believe it. He was talking about computing in 1979. They said it wouldn't be worth it. So I think there are people in this room that could invent that kind of future. Guys, we have a great responsibility, right? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. So Thank warm you. applause for Thank Mike. You.